my wife and Benita and I moved here four years ago from Texas, and one of the things that made moving difficult was leaving our friends and family. And I have a friend in Texas who's an educator. He's a principal at the high school, middle school, and elementary school level, and he would tell the story, and I found out last night that this is evidently something that they do in a training, and so almost every educator knows this. I thought it was unique to him, but he would see a six or seven year old wandering the halls and they would be where they weren't supposed to be. Maybe they're in the cafeteria and supposed to have gone to the library. And so my friend would say, what are you doing? And of course a six year or seven year old would go, well, I, 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 you know. And so then he'd say, well, what are you supposed to be doing? What are you gonna do about it? What are you doing? What are you supposed to be doing? And what are you gonna do about it? And that's kind of, where I want us to start, we all have somebody that's in authority, whether it's our boss or a pastor or, in the case of my son, Jeff, a parole officer. Some of you know the story of my son, Jeff. I'm so proud of him, but for most of his adult life, he was in the prison system in Texas. And in 2012, he was con convicted of four felonies and given a sentence of 35 years each. Stacked on top of each other, but I think it was the pro board's way of saying, keep an eye on this guy. Honestly, I was blessed that he wasn't given life in prison because there was a chance he could be released. In 2011, the parole board said, you can keep coming back, but there's no way. And in 2012, God said, there's a way. I made a way. And he was released. He was released. And, but here's the thing about, about parole. The, the state of Texas or Tennessee, wherever you are, they still want their pound of flesh. They want that debt paid, right? Yeah. And so until the year 2047, my son's on the outside, but he's still a prisoner to the state, right? Because they want that pound of flesh to pay for the sin or the debt, the, the felony that you committed. He still has someone, if he says, can I do this? The parole officer still has to say, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? He still has to report to that. We all have someone like that in our life. And that's what I want us to look at today is, what are you doing? What are you supposed to be doing and what are you going to do about it? Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 19. We've been in Acts this whole series. We continue today in Acts 19. We're going to begin with verse 11. And this is an unusual story, but I think it shows us the ability of God to work in every circumstance for his glory and for his purpose. So Acts 19, we're beginning with verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered them, overpowered them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded." And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned their books in the sight of all, and they counted the value of the books, counted the value of them, and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. <clears throat> I love this approach that educators take. What are you doing? What are you supposed to be doing? What are you going to do about it? <clears throat> Whether you're here as a follower of Jesus, you've accepted Christ, or maybe you're here and someone brought you and you're just kind of kicking the tires. You're not sure about this whole Jesus thing. Either way, that's the tension that I think most of us deal with is, what am I supposed to be doing? I struggle with this. I, I'm somewhat of a perfectionist. Actually, not somewhat's probably not a good word. I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> I want to make sure I get that perfect. And, 
And I also have the need for affirmation, but I don't think it's those two things. I think it's, I don't want to get to the end of my days and say, why didn't I do this? I don't want to have regrets if I can avoid them. And so I want to make sure that every breath I take, every day that I spend, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So at the end of the day, I can say, I accomplished something for the kingdom. I think that's the tension, right? I want to do what I'm supposed to be doing, but how do we know what we're supposed to be doing? What if we could answer that tension? If we answered that question, what am I supposed to be doing? It would challenge us with, what are you going to do about it? And so before we get back into the scripture, I want to tell you a little bit about where the story occurred and talk a little bit about the setting and see if we can put ourselves kind of in what was happening. As the story occurs in Ephesus, Paul was led to Ephesus by the Holy Spirit. And Ephesus was a town of 300,000 people. Not a town, it's a city, right? Would you agree? 300,000 people. That's not normally what I think about when I think of the towns in Jesus' day. But Ephesus is located on a port city. It's a port city, and it's, if you were to look at the map today, it's the far western tip of Turkey, and it's on the Aegean Sea, or Aegean Sea, I'm not sure which, but it's on that sea directly across from Italy. That's where Ephesus was. And here's the thing about Ephesus. 400 years before Paul came, something fell from the sky. And they believed it was a goddess, and scientists today said it was probably a meteorite. But in this thing, in this rock, in this meteorite, they saw a goddess, Artemis. We would say Diana. And they, they saw this rock, and they're like, hey, it's a goddess. And they started worshiping this goddess because they could see it. How many of you know that it's easier for some people to believe and have faith in what they can hold in their hands and what they can see. Maybe it's your bank account. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your title. Maybe it's your family. It's easier sometimes to believe in what you can see. And God says, you can't see me, but have faith in me. And so they built this temple in Ephesus, 450 feet, 200 something feet, 50 feet tall, had 100 columns around it. And they began worshiping this rock, this Artemis, this goddess, this false god. Because of the temple and because of where Ephesus was located, people came from all over the world to see this, what at the time was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And as they came, they brought with them their beliefs or unbeliefs, their superstitions. And so Ephesus became a place where tolerance was the word. Anything, everything goes. You can believe anything you want to Nobody should criticize you for whatever you believe. Does that sound familiar? Tolerance was the word of the day. So everybody just believed whatever they wanted to, but the main form of worship was worship of Artemis, Diana. How many do you know that when there's no absolutes, when there's no right and wrong, or when right or wrong is up to you, People turn to things like magic arts. They turn to horoscopes. They turn to seances. They turn to psychics to try to find out what does the future look like. I came this morning to say God holds your future. God has a plan. He's not hiding from you. He knows the plan for your life if you will turn to him rather than magic. I believe it was in this Ephesus that Paul was led by the Holy Spirit and he began preaching the gospel in the synagogue where the Jews met. And so as he preached, revival broke out. And here's the thing about this worship of Diana. It was profitable. People were making money off the worship of Diana. They were creating stone and wooden images, but they also had books, and and the books had incantations. And so you could come to them and say, can you get the evil spirit out of my son? And they would open the book, and there was an incantation they could read, and they could help do that, they thought. But they charged for that. Just like today, if you decide to go to a palm reader or a psychic, They're not doing that for free, right? So they were making money off this. There was an economy around that. So when Paul began to preach the gospel, it drew people to Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. So as that was happening, it was hurting the economy in Ephesus. And people, there were some people who didn't like it and they wanted him to stop preaching. If you're here this morning and you're relatively a new Christian, maybe within the last one or two or five years, and your family thinks you're crazy. Your family's like, what are you doing? Have you joined a cult? 
What, what are you, you're always talking about Jesus. You're always going to church. If that's you this morning, can I tell you that when you get to heaven, God's not going to say, what did your family think? Right. What did your friends think? God's going to say, what did you do with my son? Yes. What did you do with my son? God says, I'm holding you. Trust in me. And so people were profiting from this false worship. And as you might imagine, they didn't like, like Paul's preaching, but you know what? God moved anyway. That's right. God does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and how he wants to do it. That's right. Now, verse 11 says, in the midst of all this, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. They were, some of these were indirect miracles. Paul wasn't even there. Paul would work as a tent maker in the morning and he would go teach in the afternoon. And so apparently people could go into his shop and get an apron, take it home and lay it on someone and they were delivered of evil or healed. And so what happens is today people think that's a process they can use. And so I saw a television pastor one time and said, if you'll just contact us, we'll send you this pair of cloth and you can lay it on somebody and they'll be healed. So the pastor that was watching said, you know, I'm going to try that. I'm going to, I want to see what they're doing. So he orders the prayer cloth and when he gets it in, it's really, it was really like a piece of paper. But when he got it in, he opened up, it said, if you'll reach out to us, we'll activate it. But reaching out meant sending money. I don't find anywhere in God's word where he says, if you'll send me money, I'll heal you. I'll deliver you. I'll save you. God's love is unconditional. It's not based on you. It's not based on what you do. It's based on the love God has for you. God was doing extraordinary miracles, not Paul. He was doing them by the hands of Paul, but God was doing the miracles. I believe God showed up in Ephesus to demonstrate that he's the one true God. In the midst of this place where people were worshiping other gods, God showed up and said, I'm going to show you what God looks like. I am the one true God. And he was doing extraordinary miracles. How many know that when God is doing miracles, when he's moving, Satan will send imposters to try to duplicate those things? Why? Because he wants to distract your attention from God. He wants to try to take God's glory and he wants you to focus on the miracle he wants you to focus on the cloth. He wants you to focus on the person rather than on God and give God the glory. Right. So that's what happens in Ephesus. Some of the, in verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Let me stop right here for a second and tell you that anytime God does a miracle, if it's a miracle of God, it's going to point you to God and bring glory to God, yes. Yes. not a person. Amen. Miracles that are of God always point to God and give glory to God. So let's continue with verse 14. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, this meaning they were doing this, I adjure you thing. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? Almost as if to say, what are you doing to come against me? What power do you have? What authority do you have? And the man in whom was the evil spirit, not the evil spirit now, the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt, leaped on them, mastered them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. If you know the Jewish culture at all, for a man to lose part of his clothing, even his outer garment, took his integrity and his reputation. So we don't, I, it doesn't tell us whether they were stripped completely naked or partly naked, but they left the building um, after, after one man had defeated seven of them. And so, of course, that story spreads like wildfire. The key here, the key to why they weren't successful is because even though they said, I adjure you and I command you, and even though I said in the name of Jesus, they had no relationship with Jesus. They were trying to use Jesus' authority, but they didn't believe in Jesus. Jews today don't believe in Jesus. They believe in him. They just don't think he's, they don't recognize that he's God's son, the, the sovereign, the master, 
They don't recognize Jesus as the one who was sent to save us of our sins. So these guys, these sons of Sceva, who's a high priest, they're trying to duplicate the process that they had heard Paul or Peter or other apostles use. They're trying to do the same process, but they had no relationship. And when you have no relationship, you don't have any authority. That's good. So the key is not how you do things. It's who is doing the work. Yes. When God wants to do something through your life, he'll do it first in you. Yes. So then he can do it through you. And, and the scripture says in, our, in one of our life verses here that God has prepared those things for you to do before you were even born. So they didn't have the authority. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 28, you may remember Jesus said, and this was the last, one of, some of the last words he said before he went to heaven. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me by the Father. And who believes in me will do the works that I do and even more works, he said in John. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And in Luke, Luke records that Jesus said, Behold, I've given you authority. The key here is not the words in Jesus' name. Sometimes I think when we pray, we say, God, I need this, and God, I want that, and God, will you do that in Jesus' name, amen. It's almost when I write a business letter and I say, thank you for considering my proposal. I hope to hear back from you soon. Sincerely, Amy, uh, Alan Fike, or in this case, Rob, Rob Gilman. <laughs> it's, it's almost like we're signing the prayer in Jesus' name, amen. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about coming under his authority, being subject to God's will. And in that but it starts with a relationship. But in that relationship, when you have his authority, you can do whatever he wants to do. Yeah. These sons were trying to do something without God's authority. I don't know if you realize this, but apart from Jesus, you have no spiritual authority. In fact, you may be the boss at your company. You may be a senator. You may be a mayor. You may be a pastor. And everybody looks to you and you have authority and they're like, what should we do? Oh, wise one. They're asking you to make decisions. But in the spiritual realm, where the battles that are, are unseen, you have no authority save the authority Jesus gives you. So I'm, I'm begging you, don't challenge Satan in your own, on your own. But here's the thing. Under the authority of Jesus, with the relationship with Jesus, you can not only challenge to Satan, you can say, in Jesus' name, Leave my house. Yes. Leave my children alone. Yes. You can speak to Satan under the authority of Jesus because Jesus said, I'll do those things in your life. You'll be able to do them. But keep this in mind. It's Jesus. It's God doing the things. It's, it's God defeating Satan. It's never us. The key is not a process. It's a relationship. And that's what happened here in Acts 19. But I said earlier that this is a story where, that points to God doing what he wants to do for his purpose. What was the purpose that God accomplished? How did he get glory? And so turn to verse 17. Verse 17 said this, the one guy beating up seven guys, this became known to all the, re the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who are now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. They counted the value of the books and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Revival broke out. Books were burned. The things that were used for sin were destroyed. That's a sign of true repentance. You know, when, when you don't stay right next to your sin, but you back away, you change your mind and you repent, that's when, that's when God begins to get the glory. But when you destroy what you were using for sin, that's a sign of true repentance. That's what happened here. So I, I want to tell you this morning, if you are in the midst of sins like adultery or pornography or any other sin, if you're in the midst of that, and by the way, God sees all sin the same. We rank sin. God doesn't. They're all the same. But let's say that in, in my life, pornography is an issue. I can repent and turn from that. It becomes real repentance when I destroy the things that I've been using 
for sin. And so that's what they happen here. And they, they say the books in today's, these books that they were doing exorcism from, those books were probably worth, in today's money, maybe a million dollars. They made the choice to step away, but also to destroy what was being so someone else couldn't use it. How many of you, so, so miracles, God was doing miracles. How many of you would like to see God do a miracle in your life and in your family? Okay, and so many of you, I imagine, answered like, I'm not really sure what, but sure, I want to see a miracle. If I gave you time, you would probably be very specific. I need this for my family. I need this for my children. I'd love to see God move in this person. We're all, I think, at some point wanting to know, what am I supposed to be doing? And revival opens the door for that. Here's how I think most of us see abundant life. Brandon did a great job of preaching a series about abundant life. God said, Jesus said, I came to give you life and life to the full or abundant life. So I think many of us are like this sponge. This is, this is our physical and mental body. We're saved, but we're dry. The world just dries us out. And so we come on Sunday and we hear the worship music and Pastor Brandon preaches and we're just soaked. We soak in what Pastor Brandon's teaching us. To, to where now we're no longer dried out. We're full of God's power and the joy. This is not representative of the Holy Spirit in you because you got that at salvation. This is your joy. This is the abundant life Jesus promises you. And so on Sunday, you leave Sunday and you're like, man, it just couldn't be any better than this. Thank you, God, for today or Saturday, whichever, when you used to go to Saturday experiences. <laughs> Just to stop for a second, if you came on Saturday, can I just encourage you? You can still come on Sunday. It's okay. We don't have two separate churches. Right. Come join us. Come join us. And if you need help finding a place where, and you can only go Saturday because you're working, we'll help you find a place. We want you to, to worship God. God wants you to have a relationship with him. But you get filled, and you've got this uh, joy and abundant life. And then on Monday, you're driving down 65 going to work, and... Someone cuts you off and you salute them. And not, not y'all, I'm talking about me. I, 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 or Benita. So, and you lose a little bit of that joy. And then Tuesday, there was somebody who was supposed to have done a project yesterday so you could do your job and they didn't show up. And so now your boss is mad at you. Yeah. And, and so you lose a little joy. And Wednesday, you get the phone call that the person you've been praying for in your family is not going to make it, that it's terminal. And so the world just over the week brings you out. Yes. And, and all your joy and the abundant life Jesus promises just seems like it leaves you. And so you come back on Saturday or you come back on Sunday and the process starts over. Can I tell you, that's not the life God promised you. Yes. It's not what God wants for you. So I want to give you five things that I believe will help us experience the abundant life. And I, and I need to make this point other than number one, these are not things that save you. They're not jobs you do. These are the things that God wants for you. The first one is have the right relationship with Jesus. When you have the right relationship with Jesus, during the week, you will spend time in his word. During the week, you will pray and ask him for his help, and you'll honor him with your, with your witness to other people. But you'll say, God, I can't do this without you. As I drive down 65 today, keep my hands on the steering wheel. <laughs> Jesus, help me take the wheel. <laughs> so you do that during the week. That, that's number one. Have the right relationship. And if you're here this morning trying to do this on your own and you don't have that relationship, I don't know how you do it, but God is here for you. You can begin that today. Yeah. Number two. Number two is be in, be in church. Uh, commit to weekly attendance and worship. More than once a quarter or Christmas and Easter, but be around God's people because other people are going through what you're going, and, they, and the scripture says, be around those who can encourage you. So that's number two. Number three is give generously. Now, as soon as I said the word give, some of you went, oh, I knew it. We're going to talk about money, but here's, here's what happens. Most of the time, we're so afraid to say the word money that we say, give of your time and your talent and your treasure. treasure. So how many of you have ever gone, said, I need to run to the bank. I got to go to the ATM. I need to get out some treasure. <laughs> right? We're like, I need to get some cash. 
I need some dinero. I need some moolah. Right? That's what we say. Why is it that when we're talking about what God wants, we're like, give your treasure. And, I, and that's just, you know why I think it is? I think for most of us, we're holding everything like this. We're holding it closed-fisted, afraid it's going to be taken from us. And I, and I believe God knows that for most people, money is a stronghold. Yes. Not the money, but the love of money is a stronghold. And so God says, open your hands and see what I'll do. In, in Malachi, in Malachi, Jesus said, not Jesus. Jesus wasn't there in Malachi, was he? <laughs> My bad. Jesus said in Malachi, Mr. Malachi said, God told Malachi to write this. Let me just read it to you. See, see this is not what I usually do for a living. Praise God. You're like, thank God. When is Brandon coming back? <laughs> But um, in Malachi, we read, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there'll be food in my house or provision in my house. This is the only place I know of where God says, test me in this. Put me to the test, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there won't be room to store it. I believe God will bless you the more gracious you are and more generous you are in your giving. That's number three. Number four, find community. And I, and I believe finding community looks like small groups or a serve team. We're, we're beginning new small groups every week. People are starting them. You can leave here today and go to the Orange Room and sign up to lead a group. We've got resources so you don't have to do it yourself. There are people who will come alongside you. Josh will help you lead, get started to lead or get in a small group or on a serve team. And all of this adds to your week yes. so that you're not getting totally wrung out by the world. Right. And then number five, tell your story. Yes. Don't wait to be asked to be up here to tell your story. Just tell the person at work. I don't, I don't know the whole Bible. I don't know everything, but I know God did what God did for me. Yes. I was blind, now I see. That's all God. That's number five. So what happens then, as you're filled during the week, now when someone calls you and says, I need prayer, you now can pour out into that person because you're not dried out. You can pour into them, which allows them, they're like, my son is a mess right now, and you can pray for them so they can pray for their son. But when you're dried out, when you're wrung out, and you have nothing, you know what happens? Many times we say, I'll pray for you. Yeah. And that's the end of it. Yes. God wants us to live the abundant life full of joy. Yes. And so that's my challenge to you today. Do those five things. Again, those don't save you. They're not jobs you have to do. It's what I believe will lead you to the abundant life. Yes. You know, I was really, I mentioned to you, my son Jeff and and I hope you're still watching, hadn't tuned me out, but I really wanted Jeff to be here. We, we, we prayed about it and we said, God, would love for him to be here so he could meet you and you could pray with him and you could celebrate with me what God's doing to restore his life and restore our family tree. So he said, well, let me talk to my parole officer. I have to get permission to leave the state. And so parole officer said, shouldn't be a problem. Go ahead and book your flights. And so he made all the arrangements. And last Tuesday, he sent me the message that said, parole said no. And I'm like, got to be more to it. And I called him and he said, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm like, what do you mean you're sorry? He said, I feel like I haven't done what I'm supposed to do. Now, Jeff and his wife, Charity, are both working in ministry today in Houston. In fact, because they couldn't come, Charity was able to go into the prison where she used to be a prisoner and minister yesterday yeah. for God's glory. Yeah. Charity, said, I, Charity said, I sat in the very chairs that I was in as a felon and was able then to get up and give my testimony. Yeah. So I'm here to tell you that God does whatever he wants to do and he gets the glory and he can work in every circumstance. But I was, I was brokenhearted. I was frustrating. I was frustrated. So I'm like, God, what, what are you trying to tell me? I thought you were in this. I thought this would bring you glory. Many times when I pray, just show me what you're trying to tell me. What are you trying to teach me? Many times it'll be a few days and Brandon will say something or preach or I'll hear a song and then I'll hear from God. But this was almost immediately God said to me, 
Alan, I'm not Jeff's parole officer. He's not on parole with me. And so I'm like, okay, that's great. What does that mean? What, what, do you, what does that mean? And then I realized what God was saying was, he said, when your son accepted my son, I set him free. God said, your son is not on parole with me. He's no longer a slave. The chains have been broken and the parole officer may be watching and looking for any mistake to lock him back up, but not me. God's not your parole officer. He's not waiting for you to mistake, make a mistake so he can send you back into chains. God says, I want you to be free. I want you to be free. So that's, that's my challenge to you today. God wants you to be free, truly free. What are you going to do about it? God wants you to move from where you are to where God wants you to be, free in Christ. What are you doing? What are you supposed to be doing? What are you going to do about it?